Welcome to this ACCA paper F9 Financial Management a minor mistake. So in this particular section we are going to say how we're going to succeed in the paper F9 exam. So let's first of all have a go at the syllabus for the ACCA paper F9. So first of all I'd like to distinguish between the financial management and reporting. We know that the financial reporting is what we have studied in the paper F7. It's all about the accounting standards and that kind of thing. So this difference between these two is this. So, for example, if we were to invest, so for example, this is the company. If we were to invest our money into buying the, for example, I don't know, the land, because what we're going to do is on top of this land, we are going to build a building. We're going to buy the machinery, employ the labour, um, and to start our operation within this area. For example, we're going to spend $1 million. So that $1 million is after negotiation with uh, the land uh, owner in the first place. So we can buy that land from that owner, spending $1 million, for example. So the decision to invest our money into buying that land is something that is related to the financial management. It's simply because all we need to do is first of all we're going to see whether or not buying this land our company will be better off. So if this is not the case of course we are not going to buy the land. Okay? So that's the reason why first of all we need to have the financial management and after you buy that land of course we are going to report it into a set of financial statements because buying that land, spending $1 million, all we need to do is we're going to capitalise it by debiting the PPA worth of $1 million and credit the cash paid worth of $1 million. So that means, first of all, we need to have the financial management and because of these management activities taking place, from the financial accountant in the paper F7, we record those transactions into the financial statements using the debit and credit. So, as we can see, that's the difference between the financial management and reporting. Is first of all, we need to manage our activities within your organisation, and secondly, we're reporting it by recording it uh, by recording those transactions in the first place. So, having said that, we know the distinguishment between the management and reporting. Now let's see the financial management of what we do. So, normally in a populistic company, in those large companies, we will have the separate treasury function. The treasury function is to deal with these particular functions, uh, for example, investment, financing, working capital, risk, and also business valuation. In small companies, I mean, these functions, these kinds of decisions would tend to be made, for example, by the financial controller or perhaps sometimes the management accountant. So, in the paper F9, we are specifically talking about the financial management function within those populistic companies. So, let's see them one by one. First of all, the finance department here is required to make the investment decision. So that means we are going to decide whether or not we will spend that $1 million, for example, in buying this asset or not buying it. I mean, this would be depending upon whether or not the benefit of this asset is greater than the cost that we spend buying it. That's the investment decision. Now, of course, within that investment decision, we will see quite a lot of these techniques to see whether or not I can maximise the shareholders' wealth. Okay, I talked about the concept called shareholders' wealth. So shareholders' wealth, simply speaking, is the cash. We're going to maximise the cash, we're going to pay for them. That's what I mean by shareholders' wealth. It's not related to profit, because accounting profit, as you can see, we can use quite a lot of these accruals concept, for example, not cash spaces, to prepare for those financial statements. And as a result of it, the accounting profit does not equal to cash. 
So in next meditation, we will see quite a lot of these techniques. For example, we're going to use the net present value techniques. So for example, if I were to buy this land, I can operate my business onto this land and I estimate in the future I can generate five million dollars worth of cash. So that five million dollars worth of cash generated by the business, okay, so that is where we've used the NPV analysis, or you can call it the net present value analysis. to analyze this issue. So that means, when you're talking about the NPV, I mean, in this case, the NPV equals to five million. So that means, as a result from operating your business into this particular local area, you can get five million dollars somehow in the future and you discount it back in today's terms. Okay, we also touched that concept called discount, but what does that mean then? So this is quite basic here. So for example, this is now, and this is in one year's time. If you were to put $100 into the bank right now, or today, and take this $100 back in one year's time, so if that's the case then, the bank will give you, for example, 10% of interest. So if that's the case, in one year's time, you can get how much? 100 times 1 plus 10% of interest, yeah? So you can get $110 from the bank in one year's time. So that process from turning $100 into 110 is called compound in financial management terms. So that means in order to get $110 from the bank in one year's time, given the interest rate is 10%, how much money that you should put that into the bank today? Of course, you shout that at the screen, well, Steve, we're going to put 100 because that process is called discount. So that means we're going to turn the future cash flow, which is $110 that you want to get, given the interest, interest, interest rate here is to be 10%. So how much money are you going to put into the bank in order to get $110 back in one year's time? Of course, you're going to put $100 here. So that means that we have already taken into account the time value of money in the first place. And here in this case, that $5 million of this MPV has taken into account the time value of money. So that means at some point in the future, we will get more than five million. So if you want to get five million dollars, what is the money that's value at today? Of course, we are discounted back at five million dollars here. So that's uh, the NPV analysis, quite popular in the exam. Okay, so that's the investment decision, of course, in the due course. We'll also see quite a lot of other techniques. For example, for the investment decision, especially for those small companies, if you want to invest your money into a project here, because you're a small company, for example, and hence you care very much about the risks attached to this project. For example, when can we pay back our initial money? For example, I spend $100 into this project, and what I'm concerned about for this project is when can we get this $100 back. So we estimate in one year's time that we can get $50 and in two years time we can get another $50. So that means at the end of the second year we can have $100 back which can pay back the money that we spent before. So that's the idea behind it. Okay, so we touched that concept already for investment decision. Now let's look at the financing decision then. So financing decision means where does your money come from? So either your money will be borrowed from others, for example from the bank, 
or from your family members. That's called the debt finance, or you can call it the liability. Alternatively, you issue some shares, and then they give you money. So you issue some shares, you sell your shares on the uh, stock exchange, for example. So you can get those money from the shareholders, and that's called the equity finance. So that will be included into the financing decision. So why we call it as the decision is simply because we're going to decide whether or not we should borrow some money from others or we should issue some shares on the stock exchange. So that is your choice and that is your decision. Okay? So that's the second one within the financial management. Also for the financial management, we we'll deal with the working capital as well. So let me explain this concept called WC, working capital, if you like. So what do I mean by capital is what I mean by cash. What do I mean by working is something that is changing. For example, something is working or something is moving or something is changing in order to turn into cash. So for example, we've got the inventory. Inventory is working. It's simply because our aim for that is we're going to get rid of these inventories, we're going to sell it to others, I'm going to cash from those customers. That's our aim. So inventory will be one of the elements within the working capital. And also we've got the receivable as well. So that means in order to boost up the sales, what I tend to do is I'm going to help the customers a little bit by saying to them, you don't have to pay for me right now. You're going to pay for me in one month time. So from that perspective, they can recognize the receivable on our balance sheet. I mean, I know what you're saying, that's the accounting bit in the F7. Okay, we are looking at the F9. So receivable is working or it's moving because it will be increased or decreased. But eventually, we'd like to turn that into cash by receiving the money from the final customer. So that will be one element within the working capital as well. And also we've got the payable. So payable is the amount of money that we will have to pay for the supplier, but we haven't set to that yet. So that means, for example, we owed $50 to the supplier, we agreed to pay for them in one month time. So from that perspective, we'll have the payable balance onto our balance sheet, for example. So for this working capital, all we can do, the definition for that is something that's working in order to turn that into cash, but simply, it would be the total current asset minus the total current liabilities. And in this case, as you can see, the inventory, for example, were about $30, receivable 15, payable is to be 10. So that's the working capital, we can call it the WC, will simply be $70. So that means the total current asset minus the current liability. And that's what gives us 70. That's the working capital. So that's important is simply because we have to decide how much inventory that we need to hold within a company as well as the receivable. So it's simply because you can think about it this way. If you hold one inventory, you have to buy it. If you have to buy it, that would be a cost to our company. So that would damage our liquidity position of the organisation because we have to spend the money buying it. So if we spend, for example, $30 to buy the inventory, of course, we'll have to store that inventory within our warehouse and perhaps the inventory will get damaged. And that's the reason why in the paper F7, we've talked about the valuation for those inventories. For example, the closing inventory, we're going to value it at the low of the costs and net valuable body. Okay, I know what you're thinking. Well, that's so boring. So in the paper F9, things will be quite interesting. For example, we're going to decide whether or not we're going to buy 500 units of inventory or perhaps we're going to buy 600 units of inventory. So which choice should we have? Because we know that if we haven't got enough inventories in the first place, you can think about it if you're selling shoes, if you're selling shoes onto the internet using your e-shop. So if the customer 
decides to order one shoe from your website, but you say to them, well, our shoes are out of stock. We haven't got enough images to sell that for to you. So if that's the case then, it will damage your profitability. It's simply because, as you can see, you haven't got enough inventory to be sold to a customer and hence the customer will not be happy. Instead of buying that from you, of course, the customer will turn to your competitors. So that means the working capital decision, all we need to do um, from the financial manager's perspective is we're going to balance the liquidity as well as the profitability okay, of those working capitals within the organisation. So that's the reason why in the due course what we're going to do is we're going to talk about quite a lot of these ways to manage the inventory, receivable and payable and also related to cash as well. So those will be the things that we are going to cover in the due course. Okay. So after we cut the uh, working capital management, the next thing is related to risk management. But unlike in the paper P4, then the risk management in the paper F9 will be slightly easy uh, for you to tackle. The risk management will be related to the foreign exchange rate risk. So for example, you're dealing with the foreign customer. You should have received from the foreign customer for $30. But because of the exchange rate changes, you can only receive $20. So originally you can receive $30, but now because of the exchange rate changes, you now have to receive $20. So as a result of it, how are we going to hedge against that risk? I.e. the decrease in value of that receivable worth of 10. Perhaps we're going to use, for example, the forward contracts to fix that exchange rate. So the exchange rate moves is nothing to do with us. Alternatively, we're going to use the money market hedge to fix that exchange rate again by creating a series of transactions so that whenever the exchange rate moves, of course, it's nothing to do with our company. And also, we are required to know how to hedge against that interest rate risk as well. So the interest rate risk deals with where the company decides to borrow some money from the bank or deposits money into the bank. So if you borrow some money from the bank, you're afraid that the interest rate will rise because that will be a cost for your company. Yeah? Because instead of borrowing some money at 10% of interest rate, which is quite high, perhaps the interest rate will rise. For example, you have to pay for 20% of interest rate. So if that's the case then, what you're going to do is to use some way to hedge against that risk. So that's called the interest rate risk management. So of course we'll detail that when we come to due course. And finally, we've also got the business valuation as well. And that means, what is the value of this company? Perhaps your company is growing bigger and bigger. Because your company is growing bigger and bigger, you decide to acquire another company. So that's the management activity. That needs to be supported by the financial figures. That's the reason why we need to have the financial management here. So how are we going to value that business then? So for example, we've looked at the, um, their balance sheet. For example, we can call it as the statement of financial position. We've looked at the equity, the total equity of the target company. For example, the total equity of the company A is $50. So that means the minimum value of the company A will be $50. So any payment that is less than $50 may be um, highly unlikely in the real life, for example. But we value that business, that means we determine the costs of that business. That does not equal to the selling price by that company's owner to us. For example, even though we use other ways to value that business, for example, we use the market approach, we use the cash flow approach, we use the statement of financial position approach, Okay, no problem for that. We determined that value is to be 50. But perhaps that owner of the company will simply say, well, we are not charging you 50. We are charging you $50 million. Because from their perspective, they spend lots of time and effort and money into managing that business. So they want to get a premium from you. And of course, if you pay for that premium, for example, it's actually worth 50. But 
your pi for 50 million. If that's the case, the gap between these two is the premium that you pay for because you think that after buying that company, you will be better off because you think that company is actually worth 50 million dollars. So that's the reason why you spend that 50 million dollars to buy it. And from the accounting's perspective, we're going to recognize this gap as the goodwill in our balance sheet or consolidated statement or financial position, if you like, in the paper F7. I hope you can remember that. And also when talking about the business valuation, in addition to the ways that we can value a business, but also we can talk about the actual payments that we're going to pay for the owner would be just to be an art. It's not uh, accurate at all. So, you, I mean, estimates the value of that company is just to be $50, but they charge you $50 million. Okay, that happens, yes. So if that's the case then, what you have to do is going to negotiate with the owner, which means with another party, to reduce the prices down. So, business valuation, as we saw here, is just to be an art. So that means we're going to use quite a lot of these techniques to value that target company. Okay, no problem. But the final price will be determined based upon the negotiation taking place between your company and the other party together. So that's the financial management as we can see here. So, just a quick exercise that we've learned uh, within this financial management here in this sample virtual classroom course. So, case number one, we are going to see the concept of shareholders' wealth. So, shareholders are the owners of the company. The wealth is talking about the cash that we can receive. I mean, the shareholders will receive, in other words. So, it requires us to calculate the shareholders' wealth. But how are we going to do that then? I mean, the way that we're going to do it in percentage terms, so that means in percentage terms here, is where we're going to calculate, first of all, the capital gain, and secondly, the dividend yield. So first of all, what do I mean by capital gain? So capital means wealth, means cash. So capital gain. Dividend yield, dividend, which means from our company's perspective, if I earn profit, for example, I would decide to distribute the profit back to our shareholders. So the money that we paid in the form of cash back to the shareholder, that's called the dividend. What about, what about for yield? Yield means what is the amount of money that you will receive. In other words, it's like the income. So let's see how we're going to do this then. So in the question, it says A bought a share at $3 last year, but now the share price is at $6. So initially you buy at $3, but now it rises up to $6. So as a result of it, it's the capital gain, you can think about it, it has doubled the price, yeah? So how are we going to reflect this then? How are we going to reflect this double? Is where we're going to say, now the share price is $6 per share, and one year ago the share price is $3 per share. I'm going to divide by the second one, which is $3 per share. And that means the capital gain is to be 100%. So that means the share price is double from $3 times 2, that will give you $6. That's it. That's how we calculate the capital gain. What about for a dividend yield on the other hand then? So dividend yield is said in a question that the dividend has been declared by the management at, as at the current year end is to be $1 per share. And that means if you buy 100 shares, you can get $1 per share of cash which means the dividend times 100 shares. So if you buy 100 shares, you will have $100 worth of cash. But now you only buy one share, so what is the dividend yield then? 
So dividend yield is where we're going to take the dividend per share, which is $1 each, and we're going to divide by the share price. So because we bought the share at $3 one year ago, okay, so that $3, um, I mean, as you can say, we're going to deem that is the opening value of the share price in the current year. For example, on 1st January this year, the share price is $3 as well. Okay, no problem. But as one year has gone, as at the year end, the management decides to pay for $1 back to you. You spend $3 to buy the share, you get $1 back. And hence, in percentage terms, it's 1 divided by 3. You agree? Because it's like the return on the investments that you put into the company. So that's called the dividend yield. And hence, the dividend yield is when it takes the dividend, it's $1 per share, divided by $3 per share that you spent before in buying that share, and that will give us 67%. So the total shareholder's wealth is to be 167% here. So that means if you spend $3 to buy one share, up until the current year end, not only you can double the investments that you've made in the first place as the return, for example, $6 per share, but also you can get the dividend worth of one. So in percentage terms, your wealth will be increased by 167% in the form of cash. For example, if you decide to sell off that share, you can get $6 back and you will receive $1 worth of cash from the company. So that's what I mean by shareholders wealth. So in simple words, the shareholders wealth is just talking about the cash. Okay? Because profit will be manipulated by the management and also profit reflects what has happened in the past. It does not reflect what will happen in the future. So I hope you're happy. I mean, the next question is, as you can see, the share price before is $3, but now the share price is $6. Why does the share price double? I mean, according to a financial management study, they will primarily because of the two reasons. The reason number one is because that the company has invested its money in buying some of the non coin asset and used them to generate into cash, and hence increased the share price up because increasing the company's value. Secondly, Perhaps the company has used some of the effective and efficient source of finance. For example, by borrowing some money from the bank, rather than going listed onto a stock exchange. And then the cost of financing its business is relatively cheap. And as a result of it, pushing up the value of the organisation as a result. So that's the reason why the share price will increase. And of course, in the real life, and again, in the F9 course, we'll talk about other reasons why the share price will increase because of other reasons related to the capital market as well. So, let's look at the case number two then. It's where it requires to calculate the cost of the finance by the business. So, we talked about the source of finance, so that means we can either finance our business by borrowing some money or issue some shares. That means the source of finance will be debt finance or equity finance. What is the cost related to that then? Of course, when we are borrowing some money, we need to care about the interest rate charged by the bank. When we go to list it onto stock exchange, for example, we're going to look at the money that we're going to pay for those uh, bit four accountancy firms because list it onto stock exchange, issue some shares. First of all, we need to have uh, the big four help, so we're going to pay for a lump sum of money, and also we're going to pay for a lump sum of money to those lawyers as well. And also we're going to care about the required return by those shareholders. For example, they require the dividend. For example, so we are posing a question that the cost if you were to issue some shares, which is the cost of equity. It's 5%. The cost 
of borrowing some money, which is the cost of debt, is 6%. So how are we going to do this then? So the total cost related to it is going to take 5% and 6%. So you cannot simply plot them together so that the total cost will be 11%. You can't do that. It's simply because that 5% of the debt finance, as you can see, accounted for 50% of the total finance. For example, if you've got $100 within your bank, so that $100, $50 comes from borrowing some money from the bank, another $50 comes from issuing some shares. So from that perspective then, what we need to do for those 5 and 6%, we also need to times 50% for those Okay, for those um, proportion of this finance, for example, in this case, it's to be 2.5%. In this case, it will be 3%. So that in total, the total cost for the company will simply be 5.5%. Okay, in this case, as the, I mean, in technical words, it's called WAC. It's called Weighted Average Cost of Capital for the Business. So we we'll use the WAC in doing quite lots of things. For example, that would be a cost of finance for the business, or perhaps we're going to use the WAC to discount our cash flow into the investment decision, or perhaps we're going to use the WAC to value the business under the business valuation section as well. Of course, we'll detail those in a second in a due course. Don't worry. So now, finally, let's see how APC can help with your F9 course. So the, our F9 course is the live or night driven course. So before you watch our interactive virtual classroom sections such as this related to tuition as well as the revision, you are required to attend the live or night uh, driven course, perhaps using your computer, iPhone, iPad or mobile phone, etc. No problem, you can do that. Or tablet, no problem, you can do that. If you cannot attend the live or night section, there will be the recordings back as well. No problem for that. And also before the exam, we will issue the mock exam paper. Do it under the exam condition and scan your answer to our tutors and we will mark it for you with individual feedback. And of course, we will provide the tutor support. If you've got any questions during your study, email a tutor and we will provide you with the answer very shortly. So, hope to see you in the ACCA paper F9 course. I hope you find it very very interesting so look forward to seeing you in our section APC accounting for your future